Hey everyone, and welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast, where we talk to geniuses throughout the commercial real estate and building automation industries, asking them how they've gotten where they are, who's walked alongside them, and how they're helping others along the way. This is episode seven of our first season, and I'm your host, Tim Vogel. In today's episode, we're speaking with Jason Lund of JLL. Hey, Jason, how are you today? I'm well, Tim. How are you? I'm doing very well. Welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast. Thanks for having me. I uh, am very excited to have this conversation with you because I know that you uh, you take sharing knowledge very seriously and investing in those around you. And uh, you know when we talk about how can we encourage other people to share the knowledge they have and uh, you know, to, to do it with a smile on your face and an excitement about the industry, you're certainly one of those people. So in case anyone uh, doesn't know or hasn't seen, Jason was a guest at our customer event last year down in Nashville at our Building Geniuses Summit. And uh, that was a really great talk you gave. You were talking about uh, the JLL approach to technology and the fourth utility and and how partners like KMCs are extremely uh, important to helping make sure that that strategy is a realization. But that, to me, was an example of uh, you know our partnership and working together and your desire to go and encourage other people to step into this to this world. And you have a a word that you uh, often use. Uh, you say our tribe when you talk about the the commercial real estate tribe. But before we get to all of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now with JLL, and then we'll either start at the beginning or we'll work backwards. We'll figure it out. Oh, that sounds good. Um, well, part of what I'm doing, well, the, the totality of what I'm doing is is what we talked about basically in Nashville is um, we in the, in the world of real estate, and I mean we as in me, because I was a 30-year real estate guy when I got into this stuff. Um, we don't know your world. We don't know your ecosystem. We don't know the players. We don't know the types of equipment. We don't know what's better than others. We don't know much about any of it. We certainly don't know the business model. We know our world. And as you know, Tim, we've talked about this multiple times. Once you get to people that have wide decision-making capabilities, they basically live their lives in, in 30 minute increments on their calendar, trying to come to you know, these large group calls and they're supposed to make a decision about something. And boy, do we not know this space. So what we're, be, what we're doing in technology infrastructure is we're becoming almost an outsource department for our large institutional real estate clients. A group of people that, that, would, that do understand things like BMS, BAS systems, internet of things, those strategies, telecommunication strategies on rooftops and with towers, in building strategies with Wi-Fi, in building strategies with distributed antenna systems, passive systems, all of these different issues technologically that we're having within our buildings that we don't understand. Um, we're becoming almost that outsource employee or department for these large institutions so that we can sit on our side of the table meaning real estate side of the table and talk with good quality providers like yourself and know that what to say, how to, what questions to ask, et cetera. Yeah. And so how long have you been doing this with JLL now? We just uh, finished our first year uh, in March. So we're still fairly new. Um, and as you know, there was a different version of this that we were working on and uh, this has been going really, really well. I think we have a hundred and 107 million square feet of real estate under consulting contract in our group. And that's year one in a few months. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, I mean, you're, you're scaling quickly. You're obviously hitting a need that's pretty widespread throughout the industry. I know it's something that we, you know, as solution providers or technology providers inside of the building space is something we see all the time where we talk about, you know, the importance of connectivity and, and, and technology infrastructure and who's owning that and how you work within that space. And as the buildings get larger or wider in number, unless you've standardized some sort of strategy years ago, you're kind of trying to still figure it out. And that's, right. you know, the, that's kind of one of the niches you're really hitting 
uh, hard. So you mentioned 30 years in commercial real mm-hmm. estate before doing this. Now that was that was different work than what yeah. you're doing now. Uh, you know what has been the bulk of your career so far in terms of what's been your responsibility, what's been your goals? Yeah. Oh boy. So I began life, <laughs> professional <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us about when you were born, Jason. Oh, well, maybe not. <laughs> um, but certainly began real estate life basically as a commercial real estate appraiser and MAI member of the appraisal Institute is what that used to stand for. Uh, it's a national designation. Um, and I was in valuations, uh, commercial and industrial valuations for, and doing the work myself for like my first 20 some odd years in my career. And then I shifted, I was recruited out by a platform, uh, to management and leadership. So I, uh, worked my way up to managing the Southwestern United States for that platform again, in valuations dealing with a lot of the clients on a national basis, and then also sat on the global client care uh, board for that platform and represented the Western United States and also went to Australia quite a bit back and forth, meeting with our clientele there. Then I was recruited out of that into another platform, much larger, and sat on the global client care team for that division Uh, Basically, uh, for all of our largest clients, I would sit in the appraisal chair and raise our hand for for valuations in in addition to brokerage, property management, et cetera. But I did America's business development for that platform and then ended up running about five business lines for them uh, within that, again, within that segment of the business, um, North American businesses. And it was in that realm that I discovered this this small little sliver of the business I was running that had to do with, uh, and you know this story, uh, doing environmental impact reports on new antennas. And I had no idea why this was even here. And so I started dealing with the people that were involved, got deeper into it. I was introduced to a lot of business leaders as I got deeper into it that were in technology and telecommunications. And as I was dealing with business leaders, I really started to understand their model. I liked what they were bringing to the table. And I'm thinking in the back of my, you know, 30 year real estate brain, boy, we really need this stuff, but we don't ever, we don't get it. We don't, we can't speak their language. It's very confusing. And that was when the idea of this kind of, you know, bridging consulting came to be. So I originally recruited a leader to run it. That leader, we recruited a bunch of people in different segments that were in technology and telecom. And then it was JLL that came and got us years later, got me years later and said, we we just want that and nothing else. And would you be interested in doing that and building it up for us? And eventually I was. Yeah. So you said 20 years of doing valuation and ass- assessment on your own. Uh, appraising on your own. And so uh, how did you, I guess, what led to you getting into that, into the commercial real estate space around valuation? Uh, was it a an accounting background, a finance background? What was it that? Finance. Finance. Yeah, it was And then why, why commercial real estate? Uh, it was the only segment of real estate that was hiring when I came out. Um, and this was, <laughs> this is one of those things. So I went to school at, at USC, Southern Cal, um, and I was a finance major and wanted to do real estate. I, I wanted to be a developer, I thought. But when I came out, it was January 1990. And if you remember when all the savings and loans were closing up shop around the country, the Resolution Trust, Resolution Trust Corporation was busy going around the country selling off savings and loans to larger banks. And so all of these assets were getting repositioned and and repoed and they had to be appraised. And the mantra when I came out of school was survive until 95. That was what we were saying in Southern California real estate. And I'm like, okay, this is not a great time to become a developer. But (laughs) the ones that were busy as could be were the appraisers uh, because they were appraising all of these assets so that the market value is known on this balance sheet. So the bank could come over and transfer them to their balance sheet. So they were busy as could be. And one of the connections at my school introduced me to a partner at this firm. 
And so I was at that firm for five and a half years. I got my MAI designation. And then I went with, I actually moved to uh, Texas, to Houston, and got on with a national firm there and uh, started doing a lot of work for banks and things like that. In in one way, it was almost like luck of the draw, right? Roll the oh, dice totally. when, when you graduate. And that, you know, that was the opportunity that presented itself. Yeah. And that's really fascinating. And, you know, with the, with the um, education you had and kind of the, the upbringing around that, you know, understanding the foundational basics, you know, still once you get out into the world, there are some things that are a little different. You kind of have to figure out exactly, okay, so commercial real estate and valuation, what are those things that go in uh, to valuing an asset? Was there anyone early on that uh, kind of taught you or, or, or led you along the way, kind of showed you the ropes? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I'm a sponge. I think, you know, that, I mean, I, you and I have had enough deep conversations. So, um, the partners in the firm that I was a part of, absolutely. They just poured into me. They were trying to get me from, you know, base level, don't know anything up to somebody that was actually useful to them. Um, and then the people that were underneath them. So the mid, the mid level seniors in our firm, uh, cause I would go out on jobs with them and I would be almost like arms and legs and, you know, just base level work and they were, they knew what they were doing and they were helpful when I got, and that was a type of appraisal that was litigation oriented and, and bank messy stuff. When I got into bank, into bank appraisal, which was faster, more production oriented, um, the people that I was working with, I would ask them questions all the time and they would give me the advice that I needed. They would help me speed up, think about things the right way, be better. And then as I got into leadership, um, and by the way, I was mentoring people underneath me. I, I had some interns and then I, they became employees. Uh, so I was trying to give back down here, even as I was learning up here. But when I got into leadership management, I had the benefit of being with all these other players that were parallel to me in different segments of the business. And so I would want to learn and understand what they were doing and what their business model was, what was driving their reach into clients, et cetera. And so one thing I tell my kids all the time, and now they're grown, but I always tell them, I say, be interested and be, and you will be interesting. And if you're interested in everything that's going on around you and you ask those questions like, well, why, why is that important? Or how does that fit in? Or what is your business model? And how does that relate? And who's your client? And what are they trying to do? And what are you doing for them? And then how do you make money? All of a sudden, just by being interested, then when I take that other places, I'm interesting to other people because I can explain things to them and I can tell them how this works and that. And as you know, a lot of this figures into business development because if I go around you know, selling a widget and all I'm doing is holding up a little sign that says, hey, I've got a widget, you wanna buy one? That's not a great model. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in the market for widgets. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if I'm a, if I'm able to go to a lot of different clients and a lot of different spheres of real estate, and then I know exactly what that client is trying to achieve, how they're trying to achieve it, who their stakeholders are, and who their actual customers are, who's invested in them, and who are they trying to serve, and then how that whole thing works then I can kind of see where I might fit in and I can go to that client with a very tailored approach and say, by the way, I know you always have trouble from here to here. We can fill that gap. And then I get a much more interested, a much better response. And then even from the clients, and they're like, well, no, we don't have a gap there. And I say, really, that's interesting. Tell me about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't make the mistake again. And then I can also see too, well, maybe you do have a gap and you don't realize it. And you don't know it, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we recently did an exercise with our leadership team uh, that was talking about the things you know, the things mm -hmm. you know you don't know, and then like a majority of the pie chart was all the things you don't know that you don't know. And, yes. uh, you know, it's like those are kind of the scary parts, right? Now, oh, it's not that yes. you need to know everything that you don't know that you don't know, but, you know, there's little slivers in there that... <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was talking with a client just today about that. Yeah. So we we're talking with a client just today 
about several buildings that they have. And they were asking me general questions in these categories and they were the right questions. But then I was asking them more questions, filling some things out and like, oh, we hadn't thought about that. Oh, is that an is that a thing? I say, yeah, that's a thing. You know, it's a real thing. It's a thing, and you better look out for that thing because this is what can happen. And so that type of expertise, once you start bringing that to the table, then it's it's informative, and then clients, you know, start to see you as a resource, which is what we want to be. You'd mentioned kind of coming up in the industry and learning from others, but then also mentoring people underneath you. Uh, I think you said interns. Did you ever go through a like a more formal mentoring program? Did any of the companies you work for have a formal mentoring program, or was it really just sort of by nature of the hierarchy? Uh, you know, those are the ones you went to and learned from, and then likewise down the path. Mostly, mostly just the nature of the beast, um, and so getting an MAI designation, the minimum time to get that is five years and it's a bunch of classes and it's some practicums they'll review your experience they'll you know there's three levels of experience review etc so that's formal um, and it's good it's a really good education in all in just base level real estate value a lot of what i did though was just asking a lot of questions and then the model that that is always in my brain is learn, do, teach. Learn, do, teach. You learn something and that's great, but did you learn it enough so that you can actually do it? And then if you get to the point where you're doing it on a regular basis, can you teach it to somebody else? That's a whole nother level of knowing. So there's like three levels of knowing. There's that information up on the whiteboard. Yeah, I know it. And then can I do it, but then could I turn around and teach it to somebody that doesn't know it? And that's, that's when it really kicks in. That's when you know something at a deep level. You know, at the end of our podcast, what we've been saying is, uh, and until next time, learn something new, teach someone something, and build your inner genius. Perfect. So it's that, yeah, it's that same sort of model of like, you know, we're all in this together and we all have, you know, we all recognize that we have things to learn. There's the yeah. things we already know that we don't know, <laughs> mm -hmm. setting the you know the larger part of the pie chart aside. Um, but then you know how are we sharing that with other people? And you know, it yes. does take a bit of intentionality, and that's where I've kind of, I've been wondering about what those mentoring programs look like. You mm. know, sometimes it is more informal, sometimes it's more structured, but it really just comes down to intentionality. It does, and I will say this: I've got, I've got. Currently, I think four or five standing calls with people that I coach in different ways. And they're all leadership calls. I actually coach people on how to be a leader. And the steps there, first step, know yourself. Second step, know other people. Third step, think through, all right, I know myself, I know you. How can we move all this together and actually get something done? And I do that on a regular basis. So those are an hour each, week in and week out. Strictly voluntary, not paid, just good stuff. One of them is a school principal. Another one is a, you know, a real estate person. And another one's a nurse. Uh, yeah, so it kind of seems to be an, an, a natural gifting and desire of yours to do those sorts of things, to to pour into others and to help them. Uh, you know, that reminds me of something that you've uh, told me before, and that's how you view your role in your business uh, there within GLL as uh, from a servant's mentality. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, we're here to make everybody, it, it, to make this whole thing go smoother. It's, it's very much a service mindset. So we sign a contract with our client. We become their, we're a fiduciary for that client. But we also want the providers that we're talking to, we want them to have a much better experience than they're used to having. Because a lot of times our clients don't understand a lot of the language or a lot of the needs that the provider would have within a building to do what you're supposed to be doing. So the clients will push back on those providers hard and fight them on things. And we'll actually go to the client and say, no, no, you really do need to give them this. 
because this is important. They won't be able to do what they need to do without it. So we want we want everybody in tech and telco world to want us involved, just like we would want our clients to want us involved. So we want to serve both sides. And then we also want to serve in the context of educating everybody so that the next time this goes that much better and we're all doing better because of it. And that's why I'll do things like this. I'll write articles. I do, you know, anything that I can do to get the word out there uh, about all of this. I mean, this is, this is such an, a massive market and I'm not trying to keep any of this to myself. I'm trying to get it all out there. And it's like, the more we know, the more we're going to do business with each other, the bigger the pie is going to be. Exactly. And again, the, one of the missions of this podcast is to kind of open up a little bit on what kinds of like the kind of behind the scenes of how you ask questions and how it's okay to not know things and it's okay to not, you know, know what this acronym means or how this word means something different to this group of people. I mean, it happened right at the beginning when you used the term platform and how you had worked for a platform my mind immediately went to like a software platform where, you know, you were like going see, and, there it is. You know, yeah. But you know, a, a platform for you would be much different. So now knowing that our industry uh, and, and maybe some of the listeners here wouldn't know what a platform is. What was the platform that you were referring to? Very good. Thank you for doing that. Yes. I've, I've stubbed my toe many a time on acronym and, and terminology. So in real estate world, what I was talking about as far as a platform would be groups like uh, JLL, CBRE, Cushman and Wakefield, Colliers, I mean, just down the road. And by platform, what, what we are is we're a collection of services. We are a service provider to a big real estate firm. So you've got a big real estate firm out there, say like Invesco or AEW, and they've got their main line of business and they invest in real estate as a, as a security hedge, as a risk hedge. But they don't want to put thousands of people in this department. They want maybe 100 people in this department. So what they need to do is hire a firm like ours and we'll say to them, okay, you want to buy buildings in Charlotte? Great. That's where, that's where I live now. Great. So we will find you buildings to buy in Charlotte. We will help you buy them. We will lease those buildings for you. We'll manage the buildings for you. I'll come in and do the technology infrastructure for you. And by the way, when you want to sell that building again, we'll sell it for you. We'll do all of these services for you. We are a services platform. So you hire us one contract. We can do everything for you. That's what I mean by platform. And you know, just l little things like that can make such a difference. Now, being in the technology space, what have been some uh, some people that have helped you along the way kind of better understand, again, this whole different tribe and this whole group of, of people in the building space that you've been so close to, but now it's, you know, it's you know, from uh, the boardroom to the boiler room, right? Oh, absolutely. And I can't, oh gosh, I couldn't even name them all. Um if you wanted me to, but there are so many, um, and all of them have been just, you know, generous yeah. business owners, people that yeah. were heavy into business development, people that wanted to sell into real estate. There was even that group that, that I hired, um, you know, when I hired that leader in that other platform, and then we started hiring people, all of those people taught me a lot. And one of the dynamics was that, that here I am 30 year real estate person, with a client base behind me of real estate clients that speak their language, they have their acronyms, their business model. And then I'm hiring these people to be consultants to them. But what I quickly discovered is they all spoke technology and telco. They didn't speak real estate. And then I didn't understand them. So I had to sit down with each one and say, okay, tell me what you do. Tell me the, the business model. Tell me who the players are. Tell me what the economics are. And then, we needed to figure out how each one of them, how that network person, how that telco person, how that rooftop person, how that cybersecurity person, how did each one fit into real estate business model? And then I had to translate that in my head to go to my clients and say, okay, I've got these consultants and they do this, this, and this, and here's why this, this, and this matter to our model. And this is why you should talk to them. And then I go back and I'd say, okay, now this is great. You're bringing all this, but you can't talk like the way that you talk. You have to talk like us. 
So here's how I want you to say what you need to say to talk to us. So every one of them taught me in depth about their segment of tech and telco. The providers that we have hired on behalf of clients have taught me. Um, you've taught me. I mean, we've had long discussions. Like I said, just be interested when you're sitting in a conversation with somebody that knows things you don't, and that's basically everybody, there's always something you don't know. Uh, there's something to learn there. Yeah. I can still remember, I think what is one of the first conversations we had, I was telling you about our product and I was on the second PowerPoint slide and you're like, yeah, I have no idea what that means. You need to change all of these. And I'm like, oh, all right. I, now, now, just, I like this guy. Fair, to be fair, I think you had asked me to critique your, your yeah. PowerPoint. So it was fair well, I think what I yeah. said was just let me know if you need me to explain anything. I was like, yeah, <laughs> give it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It was two thumbs down. I was like, oh, that's fine. But no, like, again, that showed me how it is so easy when you're using that kind of language to to so naturally forget who your audience is yes. and then make assumptions and so what i've what i've started doing more so even since you know since that happened i think early last year was uh, you know just asking kind of questions it's like you know up front are you comfortable with this how much do you know about this or that and it helps me kind of qualify the conversation, not so much the person, but the conversation and how it needs to start going. And so you know, that's been a very helpful tool for me. And cautionary to me uh, is that the more I get to know in your space and the more conversant I am, I've got to be careful going back to this space and not using the same lingo and making the same mistakes. Like I have to shift gears and I also can't assume, like if I bring presentations to my client base, I can't assume that they know this stuff either. And sometimes I will. So I have to be careful. Well, it's just, it's a mess. I was thinking of a, a time as just a few weeks ago, I was in one of those conversations and I was talking to some real estate guys and, you know, they were using all these acronyms and I knew all of them. And then That's they got to, so like, you know, they were using SME, they were using IOT, they uh -huh. were all right, whatever it was. And then they, and then it started coming to, and you know, now we got to go help those B's and C's. And I'm just sitting there like, B's and C's. What does that mean? And I was like, it's trying to put together. And I missed like probably two minutes of the conversation because I was just sitting there thinking, what are B? And then finally, it, it was almost embarrassing. I was like, I'm sorry, guys. What? About two minutes ago, you said B's and C's. What, like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's like, you know, B class buildings and C class buildings. And I'm like, got it. It's not that I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. It's that I didn't know that, like, just the way they used it in conversation was so different. And I just, it, you know, you've heard of imposter syndrome where you're yep. in an environment that you're supposed to be in, yeah. but you just don't feel like you belong at all. Yes. <laughs> like, I've oh, had that no. this whole run. I mean, I'm just now starting to feel comfortable with all of you folks. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's time to learn something new then. Cause, uh, I, it's like every, you know, every week I'm learning something new, but that was one of those times where it was, you know, they didn't know and I didn't know, but it's just a matter of kind of dropping the rope and saying, Hey guys, mm -hmm. I've, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like what's a and platform? showing vulnerability and showing humility. And then in just being more open to those conversations, I've found many times having conversations with people that I think they, they're concerned about how they're going to feel if they don't know what you're talking about. On that end of the, con or on my end of the conversation, it's like, no, 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 I want you to know, you know, help me help you understand what I'm talking about because then like you said earlier, then we get to learn as well. 100%. Um, where do you think you developed kind of this uh, this need or, or not need, well, maybe that's a personal need to learn, do, and teach? Like, you know, where does that, kind of come from just naturally innate was it something you've learned over time that that little phrase was given to me in some leadership training that i got in one of the platforms i was in um but found it to be particularly true and helpful when i was raising the kids um and just to the the understanding that to throw something on a board or to tell somebody something once isn't enough not even close, is so critical. And then to 
kind of bring that into the context I'm in now and to recognize that just because this morning I had a phone call, an hour long phone call with two ladies that are over certain cities for this large insurance company and they're, they're overseeing like 15 or 20 buildings. Just because I had that one hour phone call doesn't mean that throughout the rest of their day, throughout the rest of this week, and then two weeks later when we talk again, they're going to remember any of that. And I had a great instruction once from, it was some conference we were at, and this statistic was something awful like, and this was supposed to be an educational conference, it was something awful like you're going to forget 90% of this within the first week. And then you may retain a couple of key pieces, but a month from now, good luck. And I just, I was like, oh, okay. So there's more there. You can learn something, but then you have to do it. You have to put it, put the feet to the ground. And then if you can find someone to turn around and teach it to, that cements it. So it really is a, a full evolution to be able to process through enough in your brain to be able to turn around and effectively teach it means that it's in there. You know, it's a very, it's a natural muscle, I think. Uh, for me when I read something in a book. Uh, there's a book by Liz Weissman called Multipliers. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those books where like every page could probably be its own book if yep. you just kind of like started parsing everything out. Yeah. And uh, what I've realized is I'm about two thirds of the way through it and I'm already to that point where I've forgotten so much of it. So what I've tried to do is regurgitate the things that I've read mm -hmm. uh, like naturally from, from memory. Um, you know, how and maybe this isn't quite your expertise, but how can we cultivate in others a mindset like that, mm. you know, to tell them, Hey, you know, you could learn, do and teach. Yeah. Well, first of all, you do it. You learn, you do, and you teach to the people that are around you. So you model it, right? Second, you declare it. You say, this is what I'm doing. As I learn, I learn to do, and then I teach it to others. And you declare that to others so that they can not only see you doing it, modeling, but you're declaring it, you're labeling it, and then they can see it in better categories. It's like, oh, he's learning right there. Oh, he's doing right there. Oh, and there he goes teaching again. You know, so it's like boom, boom, boom. And so you, you've got a, a, a bucket to hold what you're watching. It's not amorphous. And then as you're teaching others to do these things, you can coach in the moment and you can say, oh, you know, I was listening to how you were teaching that so-and-so and a little bit harsh there. You can use some different words here. This was really good. And so you can actually, in order to kind of move the, move the needle, create the change, you lift up and elevate and point at what's good. And you can say, that was good. Do more. And you can say, this was not as good. Do less or see if you can eliminate that. And then you can even propose alternative language and say, instead of saying this was really bad, you could say, so here's some areas you can work on. And it's a different language pattern. So as, and then all these different segments, and you just coach people up in their learning, you coach people up in their doing, and then you coach people up in their teaching. Do you, do you have people that are continually pouring into you in those ways also? My wife and others. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. No, yeah. every, you know, every week there's people that that's right. And, and I'll pull it out of them and I'll ask the questions, but then they'll also volunteer. It's, it's very mutual. And, which is great when you have that community around you. Yes. Uh, that, you know, also either understands that language or at least understands that, you know, when Jason asks me something or when Tim asks me something or any of our listeners, when they ask me something, I know that they're really like, I know what they're looking for. They're looking for something that's going to help them better. That's going to teach them. There's almost a tribe to that. There's a tribal aspect to that. You know, I talk about real estate tribe. And what I mean by tribe is we're, we're motivated similarly. We're in the same industry. We know each other across, you know, different business lines. And it, there's an ethos about our culture. Real estate people tend to be a little bit more laid back, a little bit more nuts and bolts. We're not flashy, you know, like maybe stock or law or whatever. So we've kind of got our thing. You can also start to identify people that are learners. And again, when I tell my kids, be interested and you will be interesting. 
you can be interested with a lot of people and only some will really be interested in sharing back with you. Others you'll get like, well, you know, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, and they just don't have to. And you're like, oh, okay. So you're not kind of of that learning culture tribe. But as you continue to be that, you identify more people like yourself. You and I identified each other early that have that same mindset. I want to learn it all. I'm always interested to learn. And then also, as you give back, you'll start to see the response. Is someone actually listening? Is someone saying, oh, and does this fit in with this and this? And how does this, you know, there's like a, again, it's, it's that word. It's that tribal aspect. You know, it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're of the tribe. You're the same. It's it's like this unspoken understanding. It is exactly. It is. Yeah. You're a fellow learner. You know, there was one thing that you so uh, you're involved and KMC is involved in this organization called Building Cybersecurity Organization, trying to build a framework around uh, making sure that buildings are as secure as they should be. Doing assessments, tying that back to insurance. There's all sorts of things coming out about that. I'd encourage people to go and take a look. But as part of that, because we were members and because of your role in the organization, you gave our sales guys a training around commercial real estate. And we had resounding uh, applause from the whole team saying that that was some of the most helpful uh, training. Uh, For some, it was uh, a refreshment, but it was much needed. Uh, For others, it was kind of new material. Uh, And I don't think there's any secret about that training. One thing that I kind of walked away with was, wow, you know, we're in, you know, this is the BCS organization and this is related to BCS, but we really didn't talk about like technology or uh, cybersecurity at all. Can you talk a little bit about why that training is included for members or, you know, why you, why you give it just in general? Absolutely. So um, the, the, the short answer to that, the reason why is because uh, cyber terrorism can be a huge Uh, and is becoming even more of a huge issue in real estate. And what we do is we provide space, physical space to occupy for human beings. And we move them up and down in elevators, we move them up and down in escalators, and we have sprinkler systems and fire alarms and all these things, and we want our spaces to be safe for the people that are in the space. And then there's also, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment on every floor that these tenants have invested in and they've purchased it or they've leased it and that this is what helps them do their business. And if all that shuts down or if the sprinklers go on and they shouldn't and all of that gets damaged, these tenants lose thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars, et cetera. So there's, there's an immediate need and it's getting worse. We know that you and I both know that. Now, the reason why I gave you real estate training and our business model rather than other training was because it's it that's an approach in business development you can say to somebody hey i've got this great pen and then you can talk all about the pen and this is how a lot of products get sold all over the world hey we make pens this is the best pen you've ever seen it's got blue ink it's never going to run out it's going to last 30 days and you can have it and you can put it in your pocket you can put it here you can put it there this is the best pen 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 and it's all about what i've got to sell now that's a huge temptation as you know and i know because that's probably how we get paid you know it's like this is what makes our business go is if we sell so many pens right so let's talk about a pen and let's talk to everybody about a pen But then you and I also know that's not helpful. So if you are in real estate and somebody is trying to sell you a pen, it's much better to come to that real estate person and say, you know, I know you're in real estate. I know that every day you all are working on leases, you're working on strategies, you're doing this and that. You've got thousands of pieces of paper that you run through. I bet you use a lot of pens in your business. And because of that, we can supply in your business this art, this thing that will help you do your business better, more efficiently, and will give you a better profit margin. So that's all about me. That's all about my business model, not yours. Because frankly, I don't care about your business model unless I know how it matters to me. It's like a restaurant. You're driving down the street and you're passing all of these signs. Well, if I'm not hungry, 
McDonald's is of no use to me. But if I'm starving and I need something to eat, then, oh, there's McDonald's. And, oh, there's Wendy's. And, oh, there's Morton Steakhouse. And what decision am I going to make, you know, et cetera, because I have a need and it's identified. That's the difference. So when I was talking to your team, I was wanting them to understand our model because the biggest problem that we have with tech and telco coming in to sell to us is they just want to focus on the product that we don't understand and we don't know what it does. And we certainly don't know how it fits into our business model. So if you come in with our business model in mind and, oh, by the way, here's this product that will make your business model better, faster, stronger, more profitable, et cetera, it's a much better approach. Yeah. Well, again, it was so helpful. We recorded it for the team, and I know I've gone back and looked, you know, watched it at least twice. I know other people on the team have as well. So, again, it, it continues to be a resource. What about for our system integrator partners? Again, they're typically working on the mechanical systems, uh, a lot less boardroom talk, a lot more boiler room talk. Um, how, how can they gain some insight into that side of the business? Uh, you know, first for understanding, then, then maybe two for influence. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And again, it's, it's understanding what you're providing. So, your systems integrators probably think that they're providing systems and they're integrating them, but that's not what they're doing. <laughs> that's the mechanics of what they're doing. But what they're doing is they're providing a service. There's, a, there's something that the business has ordered, something that, the, that is needing to be there, but there's also a lot that's around it. So take, for example, a commercial building. And, and one of my guys and I were talking about this just today the way that things were installed in this particular aspect of technology actually impinges on the utility of the space for the tenant. So from, uh, from our standpoint, people that oversee this, what we're saying is, all right, not only will we bring in the right technology, but we'll make sure that the technology gets installed correctly, that it's actually what was ordered that it shows up in all the places that it was supposed to show up in and it didn't get installed in places it's not supposed to get installed in. And the reason why is because there are actual physical tenants, human beings that will occupy this space and that want utility from that space to do their business. And what you're installing shouldn't be noticed, shouldn't be seen and should function perfectly, just like a great waiter at a very expensive restaurant. You do not want that waiter to become the center of your show. So you don't want their absence to be noticeable and you don't want them to be over present. You just want them to be there perfectly anytime you need it without thinking about it and you go on with your business meeting, your fancy lunch, fancy dinner, proposing to your future wife, whatever it is. So in the same way, when you think about bringing in systems, do you have a tenant in mind or the building owner in mind? Do you have the employee in mind? If it's an owner-occupied building, do you know if it's an owner-occupied building or if it's a tenant building? And how are they going to be using this space? Are they going to lease an entire floor to a tenant and then five years later, they'll tear all that out and then they'll divide the space in half and then all of a sudden they'll have five different you know, they'll have these smaller spaces. Do you need space to be flexible like that? When you're integrating systems into a space, you're not just installing to get out. You're thinking through how the space is going to be used and by whom and for what and why. And then when you speak to somebody like us and say, hey, I'm systems integrator number four that you've heard from today. And I'm the best system integrator. I'll get it in faster. I'll get it in cheaper. I'll get it in, you know, whatever. And then you come in and you say, okay, now how's that space going to be used? Okay. And is the owner going to use it or is that for tenants? Uh -huh. And are they short-term leases or long-term leases? In other words, are you going to be churning through and is it going to be reconfigured or is it going to be constant? Is it a law firm? They're pretty picky. Or is it, you know, Joe Blow? All of those types of questions, all of a sudden you've got my full attention because those are my concerns. That's what I'm going to my owners and saying we're going to take care of. So if your concerns are my concerns, all of a sudden you've got my full attention and you differentiated yourself in a big way. Yeah. How's your rent roll? Is there anything we could do to help you? Well done. That? You have watched our thing. Good job. 
That's right. Yep, yep, yep. I told you. I just, I, paying attention. Slow learner. There you go. Uh, repetition is key, but uh, it gets there. No, that's that's really great. So, Jason, when you look at, um, so you know, one of the things I, I'm I'm trying to uh, let's say thread the needle on with with the podcast is I you know I don't I don't want to say we talk to young guys and old guys but you know we talk to people that are in a career journey and you would agree that you're on the tail end of the bell curve or at least the 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 latter half of the bell curve uh, however much time that is do you, how do you intend to use that time to continue to spread this information and this knowledge and to bring up the next generation of people in the commercial real estate space or technology space? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And you and I have talked about this. I mean, with things like this, uh, podcast, terrific uh, articles. I've done video clips. I mean, I'm going to educate my socks off for as long as I'm in this. And part of it's self-serving. I mean, I'm, I'm building this division a service within the JLL platform. Well, this is a service that JLL or none of the other competitors have ever offered. We will we will oversee the full build out of your technological systems. We'll help you design the right strategy for that building, and we'll lead you to the good quality providers that do this every day. And these are hundred million dollar companies, two, three, four hundred million dollar companies, billion dollar companies. We're not going to do it. We're not going to get into that space. Why would we compete with all of those people? Instead, we'll be that narrow wedge in between this this multi-trillion dollar ecosystem here, tech and telco, and this multi-trillion dollar system here, real estate. And just like JLL does with property management, brokerage, et cetera, it's just a service. We'll connect you. We'll connect you well. We'll help you sort and navigate and guide. So the more I educate on that in the real estate world, and say, look, these are all these things you need to think about and look at the savings that we produced because we thought more strategically about this because we went and got five DAS systems all at once rather than just buying them one off in the local market because we did this as a portfolio strategy instead of just, hey, let's try it on this building. So it's a way to think and educate. And then from the tech and the telco side, I am completely devoted to those that will listen, which is yourself and others, helping them understand our business model. Because the more you understand what we're trying to do, you all bring 10, 20, 30 years of your experience and your knowledge in your space. And if you understand our world better, you'll be like, oh, we could fix that, that and that. Because that's easy. And we go, that's easy. I've never knew that that would be easy. It's like, oh, yeah, that's easy. Oh, okay. And that's, you know, I say this to the, um, I call them widget providers, just to keep it generic. But, you know, you've got these telco folks or these technology folks, and they come up with this really cool widget that they think is really, really cool. And it does this thing. And they think this is great. And they bring it out. And they're like, boy, I hope somebody buys it. You know? And it's like they're on this side of the wall and then all the way over on the other side of the wall are real estate people that may or may not need it. And they just keep trying to throw it over, hoping that it sticks. And I'm like, no, 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 let's break down the wall. And you guys are really, really sharp and you can design and build and do all these really cool things. So why don't we just tell you exactly everything that we struggle with? Here's our day to day. Here's our motivations. Here's our customer base. Here's all the problems we have in between. Based on everything you know. Got anything that'll fix it? And that's the thing that I bring to the table is uh, you guys and gals in, in the tech and the telco world continue to educate me and continue to help me understand all that's out there. And then I bring that into this side of the brain as and I step into a real estate meeting and I say, you know what? There's solutions out there for these four or five or six things. And my real estate folks go, really? And I say, yeah. So in a small way, I do what you do. But the more I can help you understand what we do, the more solutions you can bring. Well, and Jason, that's one of the things that I so appreciated. And that one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show was because you take this kind of open-handed, vulnerable, authentic approach to uh, this issue that is these two worlds sort of colliding and trying to navigate each other. And uh, you just like pour out into others. And you don't always ask for anything in return, you know? 
<laughs> yeah. You're like, hey, I just want you to better understand. I just I want you to know. And then you're like, you know, what you do ask for in return is, well, tell me about like what you do and how, and it's just this kind of lifetime learning, uh, again, authentic approach to this that I've just always appreciated. It's enriched me. It's enriched the rest of the team here. And I know that you're doing this all over the place for all types of other companies as well. And so that's why it's like very clearly you're a building genius. Yes, you have the all the commercial real estate space and and you know our, our kind of core business on the technical engineered side may not be you know that your key expertise in any of you know it's not you know what you bring to the table all the time. Uh, but it's just you want to know and you want to learn and you are interested, which makes you very interesting. So thank you so much. Uh, anything else you want to make sure that the team or uh, the team? Well, yeah, I'll tell the team. But anything else you want the audience to know about you? This is I'm just very thankful to be in what I'm in. I'm thankful to do things like this. Thankful for you and for all you've taught me. So, yeah, I'm a resource. If anybody in your team needs me, they know how to reach me. Uh, again, would love to continue on. Well, with that, that wraps this episode of the Building Geniuses podcast, a production of KMC Controls. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we encourage you to subscribe and share. And if there's anyone you know who should be on the podcast, tag them in the comments or reach out to us on social media and we'll tag them in the comments. As always, we appreciate you listening. And until next time, learn something new, teach someone something and build your inner genius.